and this stuff frequently needs to bolt on from the outside. Uh, additionally, it's also important to uh, have cloud components in order to be able to share. And it's frequently um, important to have uh, uh, proxy collections off somewhere else um, as sort of self-contained objects. So the, the um, issues around digital asset management have gotten more complex. Um, this, uh, as Ken indicated, there's a set of books that I've got. Um, for those of you who win a book um, in the raffle, uh, you'll get your choice um, of, of any of these. Okay. Um, and as uh, Ken indicated, I'm um, now the Chief Product Officer at Tandem Vault. It's been a, a wonderful opportunity to take a lot of what I wanted to see in the world and actually make it real. And there's there's a number of things that are described in in the Dan Book 3.0 that are that are actually pretty hard to find in the wild. And some of what we'll talk about today is actually pretty hard to find in the wild. But I do want to open your eyes as much as possible to um, how all of these parts can fit together in in a new and different way. Okay, so let's uh, start with some trends. Uh, everybody has seen this acceleration to the cloud. Obviously, the pandemic was a huge driver of that. All of a sudden, people needed to work remotely, and the only way to do that really is is with some kind of a cloud application. Or it's it's not the only way, but um, there's a, another trend that goes that's a sort of sub trend in this, and that is that um, the uh, the malware and ransomware epidemic is making responsible system administrators extremely reluctant to let people into the uh, institution's system. And so this is another reason that um, uh, the collection management is being pushed off into cloud services because uh, an on-premise system that you allow people to dial into is an inherent security risk. And, <clears throat> and so that's, that's a second driver to accelerate to the cloud. And I believe that, you know, that, and then the, you know, the third one is the sort of my stuff everywhere um, thing that we've all gotten used to, you know, we've gotten used to stuff that's on my computer is also on my phone or I can grab it on the web. And, um, I don't think that is uh, that this is not a blip. This is the way everything is going. So um, that's an important trend. <clears throat> Another trend that we see in in Dam World in uh, all kinds of places, and I'm I'll be curious to hear how many of you are seeing this in your institutions, is the need for multi departmental um, access to media objects, and you know, the, the old original dams were, were either built usually for marketing or production. And everything about the way they're designed and built is, is done with the expectation that they're going to facilitate that work, the, the marketing or, or production work. Um, when you move into a, uh, the larger needs that we now have with visual media objects, then... Um, you, you quickly uh, develop capabilities then that, are, that the rest of the institution wants to access. So, you know, HR wants to access this and facilities management wants to access this. And, and so this, this material um, visual media is, not, is no longer just the province of, you know, the marketing department or the production department. It's now something that everybody has. And um, that is driving uh, a lot of the um, new purchasing of dam, but also, you know, people just need it. And, and a lot of times with a marketing dam, there's just, there's not a way to do it easily. And I'm sure there are many people in this group who've had requests from other people within the institution who say, Hey, could I get my little corner of the, uh, um, of that, of the dam? And, and you're like, sorry, I, I just really can't do that. You're going to have to get your own because, because it's just not built for me to give you that kind of access. 
Uh, another thing that we're seeing a lot of, and I think this was um, this was also accelerated by the pandemic, is the need for crowdsourcing, um, and that obviously when photographers can't move about as easily as they did before, then if you want to if you want to feed the beast and have this visual media um, collection and stream that that institutions often need, you're going to have to get it from somewhere else. Um, again, a lot of dams are just simply not built to accommodate this in any way. You know, the opening up uh, the, a pipeline for crowdsource is just not possible. Um, and yet it's a thing that people really want to do. Uh, the other thing that we're we're seeing a lot of, um, I, I saw it a, a lot in the a job I had a couple of years ago working for um, a communications firm is the need to have stakeholders in the organization tell you about the media that's in there. So um, there's no way that the photo office is going to know the names of every single person uh, or the parameters of every single event. And so you have this need for crowdsourcing and that's becoming a uh, something that's that's growing um, significantly. Uh, and then we, we need uh, systems to link to each other. So, you know, the applications where, you know, if you're using Slack or you're using um, uh, Dropbox or Box or a CMS um, uh, to communicate with, with your uh, faculty, staff, or students, then you need that oftentimes to be linked. So, uh, API accessibility, full API accessibility is becoming uh, essential. It, it really is essential now in any kind of a dam. Um, and this is an interesting one to me that um, not, not that long ago, say 2009, it was reasonable to expect that everything you need to know about a file is something that you could kind of add as metadata and that information could live in the dam or in the file. And we're in this world now where things are, because things are linkable, people expect that they can do it. And so there's um, a real desire to have metadata link between, you know, whether it's, whether it's a, a file itself and say the event where the file was taken, or it's a person, information about the person. Um, this, this is all information that is, is, it's too large for you to stuff into a dam. There's too much to know about people, events, um, uh, or, you know, kind of anything that, that where there could be a definition. Uh, so that's an important change as well as the, the ability to link out for other data. You know, we see this obviously with just GPS systems is that there's a tremendous amount of information that can be linked via GPS. And, you know, Google's got a ton of information that's GPS related. And if you have those coordinates, you can, you can uh, know a lot about what's in a picture. Uh, the other thing um, and I'll be very interested to hear uh, the questions about this is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, I'm going to go over what I think are, are sort of the places where it works now and the places where it doesn't really work uh, right now. Um, there's a whole lot of promise there, but there's a whole lot of uh, empty promise at the moment as well. Um, but it's an, it's certainly an important thing. And for, you know, specific things, it's, it's essential. I, I'm going to hit two big structural um, issues here right at the beginning because they set the stage for how I think you need to be thinking about your dam. And the first is that uh, visual media is now a language. Um, everybody is using it for, and, and really this was brought about by the smartphone. Um, you, you expect that you can send people pictures and people can send you pictures, you know, pics or it didn't happen. Um, and, and that is uh, becoming an essential part 
of all communications. This is one of the reasons we're going multi-departmental in this, you know, that this, this is the direction. Um, visual media is an incredibly efficient way to encode data. Your, your brain's basically a visual computer. Uh, and we have now a, a new vernacular. Um, this is one of the few slides I picked up from 2017 when that was new. Um, and, you know, it was it was like groundbreaking that we're that we're breaking the fourth wall with a selfie that goes out to Instagram during the Academy Awards. A kind of thing that is utterly commonplace now that the um, that people are are shooting pictures and distributing them in real time as events happen and that that is uh, an essential part of what everybody expects from events now is that this information is going to be distributed in a multifaceted way in real time um, let's talk just a couple of points here about this this kind of language of visual media um, you know it, it essentially just happened nobody nobody planned it but all of a sudden because of the smartphone everybody was able to start communicating with pictures. And so there are, you know, pictures of everything now and it's, and because it's so efficient, um, it's, it's just the way things are, it's not going back. Um, as a language, it's a machine language. It's, you have to write with a machine. That is your, your camera, your, your phone. Um, doesn't have to be a phone, but uh, some kind of a camera. Um, and you have to read it with a camera and those have ramifications or you read it with a phone or some kind of computer. Um, those have real ramifications for how you build a system. You know, you need to be able to have input and output and it needs to be on the sort of many to many scale that people are used to now. If you're communicating with visual media, it is not enough for you know, a photographer to go out, shoot an event, have some material and push that out, that's, that's an essential part of an institution's communication, but I don't think it's sufficient for the entirety of the communication. Um, and so this is, an, this is an interesting one that I sort of spent a lot of time going down the rabbit hole. Um, essentially what we're doing when we, when we speak with images is that we're trading objects back and forth. We're trading digital objects back and forth. Um, you can't paraphrase a photo. You must actually have a copy of it. And so you, you know, you pass it along to somebody else. Well, there's, a, as photographers, we know there's a tremendous amount of, of back end uh, mechanics to properly handle media objects, to properly handle photographs and um, the capabilities within dam systems are easily extendable out into what um, uh, the you know sort of larger institutional communication can make use of but it, it's uh, I, I think it's really illuminating to think about it as this you know we're trading digital objects back and forth um, as a way that we actually communicate um, and I'll talk a little bit about the challenges of rights management in that kind of situation um, a little bit later. But but that's you know but one that that is one of the facets that we have to deal with if you're communicating with visual media is you have to deal with rights and permissions in a way that you don't with textual speech. Um, you know there's there's, there's not the same level of privacy rights. There's not the same level of intellectual property rights that are around um, text-based speech that exist with, with visual media. Um, and uh, lastly, in this slide, uh, I, I would say when I'm, you know, when I'm talking about visual media, I'm, I'm not just talking about a rectangle full of colored dots. Uh, I'm I'm actually talking about uh, oftentimes rich media and multi multiple media objects, photos, video, text, graphics, audio, data. I mean this this is what the, especially the you know generation of of uh, 
customers, if you, I don't know how you guys talk about it, but the, you know, students, the people you are serving as the customers of your institution, you know, they understand visual media objects as this rich um, object of, you know, photo, video, text, graphics, audio, data, Snapchat and Facebook uh, and Instagram have taught them that. Um, and, and so to, to sort of wrap that little section up, visual media is being used by nearly everyone for nearly every purpose. And I think that people sitting in the, in the chairs that many of you guys are sitting in within an institution are the best suited to help that institution figure out how to manage this, this set of issues. Okay, uh, one more background item, uh, sort of a structural item, and then, then I'll get into what's, what's future facing. Um, and that is uh, a dam system, I believe is essentially built on these three principles. There's a storage layer underneath, a uh, tagging layer to say, uh, I'd add some facts, but then most important is the uh, curate or or curate or creation layer that's sitting on the very top. Um, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, first we need to make sure we're safe, um, and then we can go all the way up to self-actualization. And in um, in visual media, that's you know preservation, and then can we move it into the future? Uh, can we find it? Can we optimize it? Curate it? and then make use of it. And I think it's very helpful to approach any dam system with um, an evaluation of whether it's doing that for you properly. Um, interestingly, there, there's, there's a thing that has changed there and that is that cloud systems actually take care of most of the storage, but, but let's look at traditional storage here, um, which includes that stuff like uh, folder structure, file names, file formats, devices, and backup processes. Um, all of that stuff is, is part of storage. Um, and essentially it's stack it up and back it up um, is really the best thing that you can do. It's storage should be simple, should be easy to understand. Uh, and, and I do, suggest that even if you're using a cloud system for the general access to your collection, it's very important to have a copy on a device in your own possession within your institution that has a copy of everything that you wanna keep. Um, uh, cloud systems have a lot of reliability and um, a ton of value for access, but if we're just you know, if we're trying to be really safe here, you you should have a copy yourself. Um, the tagging layer is essentially applying facts to your uh, to your collection, and that makes stuff discoverable. And then the curation layer sits on top, um, and that's where you bring stuff together to tell a story or to. Uh, serve some some purpose, and um, that's where the value is, and it should be something that your dam system uh, will will allow you to to do easily and effectively, and to do that you know distribution, the self actualization of the of the visual media. Um, okay, so those are the background things, and then I'm gonna sort of talk about how some of this can be done and, and where some, some new stuff is happening. Uh, this, this is a guy that I, I like to read on Twitter, uh, Benedict Evans, and he, uh, he wrote this one point and I was like, wow, that, that is deep, man. <laughs> all search eventually needs curation. All curation eventually needs search. And, you know, it's, it's true as these collections grow, uh, you can maybe search and find stuff, but you almost immediately need to have some kind of curation on top of uh, a large collection because, you know, you, the collection manager, may know where everything is. But now that we're making these things available to a, a much broader group of stakeholders, we need to be able to point them to the material that that is um, uh, that we think is important or relevant or tells the story properly. and. Another thing that's that you'll see 
uh, how I've approached this is that even the, the search terms themselves need to have, I believe, some level of hierarchy. It's not enough to just throw a ton of words um, at your pictures uh, and expect that people are going to make sense of the library. And I'll show you how there's some ways uh, that we've implemented to, to prioritize that, to, to understand, um, to, to communicate what's important. Okay, so let's talk about how people actually discover stuff. Um, and this also is in a hierarchy. Um, so the easiest stuff to discover is the curated content that the collection manager has said, pay attention to this. That should be front and center in your system. That's, that's the highest value. Um, it's the, the easiest for people to find and make use of. Uh, then there are elements within uh, most software that have, for instance, a, a pick list that you can filter. And so that's, that's a place where a collection manager can say, this is the important stuff and I wanna put this in front of you. And um, it may still be a filter, like it's gonna show every picture of dogs, but dogs are really important to our institution. So we wanna make dogs easy for people to find. Um, this is one that uh, I don't know how many Lightroom users there are out, out here who are using the uh, hierarchical keywords, but once you get used to that, it's just a, a fabulous way to be able to make even a very large collection um, navigable. So uh, tag trees that you can um, create in an orderly manner that navigate naturally by a regular human being are uh, an essential tool for making a large collection understandable. Um, there's an, another sort of side version of that, which are tag clouds. And, um, you know, we're all familiar with this in, in a bunch of different applications where you, um, you know, you, you select on a group of pictures and then you can see whatever keywords are uh, contained in the selected group or the, the shown group. Um, and that, that does a couple of things. One is it filters down to just the relevant material, but it also makes it super discoverable. Um, so tag clouds, really important tool, I believe. And, uh, and faceted search, I'll show you, I think I have a couple of screenshots of this um, or a screenshot anyway, but faceted search is, is what you get on Amazon, you know, or let's say B&H, you know, when you say, oh, I'm looking for a Nikon, uh, a Nikon lens, or I'm looking for a lens, I want it to be Nikon, and then it filters down to just the focal lengths of Nikon lenses. And then if you say, uh, uh, no, I want it to be a, a zoom lens, a short zoom lens, well, it's gonna show me the you know eight Nikon branded or the four Nikon branded short zoom lenses. That's called faceted search. Um, and essentially it just, it just is those, you know, it's it's exactly what you see on the left-hand side of B&H and you see it in Amazon and, and you know, most retail has faceted search now. And actually the thing that's powering faceted search, uh, this thing called elastic search is, is um, used very frequently in, um, in DAM applications now. Uh, autocomplete helps as well. I start typing, not sure exactly how to spell the name. And then the, you know, the last thing is just blind search. Like uh, I'm gonna type a phrase in and hit return. And the thing is you don't know, like, have they called it cow, cattle, bovine, farm animals, cows? Uh, and the vast majority of your users are um, used to Google where they can misspell, they can put in synonyms um, and still get what they're looking for because Google knows, you know, has such a deep back end and actually knows so much about you. Um, but that's a that's frequently a, a pretty poor user experience in an institutional dam because you don't have that same level of um, of rich metadata to power search results. Um, so blind search is, you know, it it's really should be the last thing, and 
you should be configuring your system in such a way that, uh, you know, ideally you're, you're using an application that allows you to, to sort of have this, this hierarchy as, as uh, outlined here. So let's, let's talk about curation uh, versus tagging. Tagging is attaching facts to files. So all pictures of dogs, whereas curation is the process of selection. Like these are the pictures of dogs that are relevant to my institution, you know, to, to our school. Um, it should be assisted by tagging, but it can't be replaced by it. And this is, this is one of the negative trends I see in damn world is that oftentimes the applications are basically just assuming that search is all you need and you don't need curation. And that's, you know, I, I believe that's really problematic. It should have a hierarchy. Um, so it navigates intuitively. Again, you know, people come to a collection, it's large, they don't know where stuff is. Um, if you, if you build a hierarchy that they can navigate intuitively, um, they're off to the races a hell of a lot faster. Um, and, and then this is where we start getting into the kind of the cool forward facing stuff of the ability to add context to your curation. Um, so I can, you know, can I add information that helps a viewer coming to this understand what it is that they're actually looking at? And ideally you'd have some kind of crowdsource uh, curation. So, you, you know, this is, this is generally pretty simple here. You know, in this case, it's a, it's a simple, uh, library structure um, that navigates like folders. People just navigate this stuff um, easily. It's, you know, it's the first place they're going to go and they're going to start like opening up and see if they can find uh, what they're looking for. And if you build your, um, build your curated collections in such a way that uh, it makes sense to a general user, you're, you're way ahead. So uh, obviously this is just the easiest way for people to find stuff. It's also the thing that takes the most effort because somebody on your team has to actually say, these, these are the subjects we think are important. This is an intuitive navigation of that system. And, um, and then now I'm going through and I'm going to choose which are the best photos, video, videos, PDFs, whatever type of uh, media that um, that are appropriate to these different subject matters. So it's the highest level of effort, but it's also the highest level of return. One of the things that um, that we've done that I was that I've been pretty excited about is that in creating uh, curated groups, um, we're starting to add um, content management CMS functionality to the collection so that, um, when you put something together for a purpose, you can communicate that to somebody who's coming to the site for the first time and uh, addressing the collection for the first time to understand what it is that this thing represents and why these things are put together. Um, and, you know, obviously you need to have custom sequencing and um, uh, the other thing that I love is the ability to put links in there, um, oftentimes having web links um, in a curated collection gives you the ability to, uh, to understand what it's about. And, um, you know, this is an example where just, you know, mousing over a web link can, can tell you what's, you know, uh, more about the organization as well as a single click to get over to the Facebook page um, uh, for that organization. So the enrichment of the collection itself becomes uh, a really important and valuable tool. Uh, I'll also um, just note right here, in this case, uh, this is actually a collection that's created by just a a regular normal user doesn't even have to be done by an administrator. And that's one of the things that we've opened up in Tandem Vault is this idea of many to many communication where your curation 
doesn't only have to happen by administrators, but we put the same tools for communication within the reach of just ordinary users and make, make it easy to, to make those, um, those curated groups. And I, I really think this is where dams are going. Um, okay, tagging. Uh, all tags eventually need tags. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's a, a watch a, you know, little aphorism from me. Um, so most dam, let's talk about tagging a little bit. Most dam systems, and this, this is, gets so obvious once you see it, they're, they're not built to help you tag. They expect you to tag somewhere else. I'm, I'm sure there's a ton of photo mechanic users uh, in this group who just do all their tagging in photo mechanic and they're you know, testing and hoping that any tags that they create are passed along into the system and become searchable within the system. Um, there's a big problem with that though, and that is that we, you know, we've, we're now in a, in a situation where there are multiple people who are working on uh, a collection and you know, photo mechanic is a one at a time operation. It's, you know, one person doing it and then pushing the stuff out. It's a one way street done by one person. Um, I don't know whether we have anybody in this group who's, who's got people looping stuff back out of, you know, an upload running through photo mechanic and then, you know, adding new stuff to it and pushing it back up. But that gets to be a super cumbersome workflow. Really, you should be able to do all of this work in the cloud yourself, you know, in, in the application that you're using. Um, so when you look around, you see that a vast number of systems expect you essentially just to open up files one at a time and just start typing tags. Um, if you see that, what you know is that that application is not trying to help you uh, do the annotation. Um, uh, the other thing that that is a huge trend right now, and I, I think it's terribly mistaken, is that they think that uh, not Al, but actually AI, artificial intelligence, uh, can do it all. Um, and there's a ton of um, damn applications these days that essentially are just assuming that you're gonna dump a bunch of stuff in and AI is gonna tell you everything you need to know about it. And we as photographers know that that's just simply not possible. There's stuff that you know from being there when you shot the picture, you understand why you're shooting the picture. Uh, you know, what's the assignment? Why am I choosing this picture? Why have I selected it to upload? There's a ton of, of important context and meaning that the AI just simply can't um, uh, do. It, it, we're, we're way far away from that being possible within the, uh, uh, within most AI systems or really any AI systems. So that's not gonna do it. So you need to tag yourself. So there's, there's things that make this a lot easier. So apply to many to once, drag and drop. Um, uh, and that drag and drop, you should be able to do, you know, discontinuous files in the same way you can do with Lightroom. You can, uh, you know, you can, select a bunch of files, drag it onto uh, a keyword, select a, another bunch of files, drag it onto a keyword. Uh, they don't even have to be next to each other. Um, you should be able to, you need to be able to maintain controlled vocabularies. And this is becoming essential as we think about uh, opening up the collections to more and more people using it, is that you need to have some discipline about how you use tags and create controlled vocabularies that are navigable and understandable by your, you know, your large stakeholder group. Uh, and you need to be able to maintain it. Um, uh, it should be something that uh, has a browsable hierarchy, I believe. Again, the, the Lightroom keyword, uh, um, keyword tree panel, the hierarchical keywords are wonderful example of this where where you can organize stuff so that you you understand exactly what this is because you understand what the parents are um, you need to be able to grow the taxonomy this is this is a thing that uh, controlled vocabulary people 
kind of makes their head explode a little bit. They oftentimes they think like controlled vocabulary. I'm going to make the vocabulary and it's done. Well, if you think about a university photographer who's shooting events, you know, there's constantly new events happening. There's constantly new people coming into the, into the institution and your controlled vocabulary needs to accommodate that. Uh, so you need to be able to grow that taxonomy organically and do it, do it reasonably well. Um, uh, this is another one. I, I'll show you a slide of this. Um, this one is the thing I've wanted for 20 years um, and I didn't get it until I built it, but um, find files that do not have a tag. Let's say you've gone through a, a big shoot and you've tagged everything with dog that you think is a picture of a dog and you think you did a good job. In order to verify that you've done a good job, you just wanna say, show me every picture that does not have the tag dog on it. And then you can see, oh, look, I missed that one. Um, without that ability to show does not have a tag, you can't really check your work. And th it becomes super tedious. You know, maybe you have to open up individual files to find out whether it, you know, has a dog tag on it or not. Um, and as we think about, uh, as we think about crowdsourcing, requesting or requiring tagging on upload from a pick list becomes really essential as well. So you don't want people to just freeform it like they do with their uh, Instagram and just hashtag whatever. Um, you, if you're maintaining a uh, controlled vocabulary taxonomy, you want to be able to have people uh, pick list. So. Um, you know, quick illustration here. Again, this is a whole lot like Lightroom. Uh, you can select multiple files in, in our system and, and you can just drag it uh, on, on a term inside a hierarchy. Uh, you have full control over that hierarchy. Um, you can add new terms. So if, you know, we now have a curling team, we can add that into athletics and uh, add that in the proper place so it makes sense. And, um, and that is, is quite helpful and, you know, important to be, to, to have um, your new taxonomy built in uh, according to the structure that you've already created. Um, taxonomy trees need to be searchable because you end up with stuff that's, that's buried deep in hierarchies that, you know, the older, and bigger your collection is, the more stuff you're going to have in there. People aren't going to necessarily know it's there. Make it easy to find. Uh, this is where you know tagging needs needs its own level of search. Uh, and this is an example of the um, does not have tag. So, you know, I thought I've tagged everything that's a football image, but then when I click on does not have tag, I see that you know right above and to the right of the of that dialog box. Oh, there's a football picture. Oh, I need, I need to tag that. Um, so that, that kind of, these kinds of tools that allow you to easily and intuitively tag and understand whether you've done a good job are the kinds of things that, that need to be in a dam application in order to, to get the most out of it. Um, here's a, another, Screenshot. Uh, I don't know whether other people have something like this, but one of the things that we've implemented is what we call tag suggestors. And they're just uh, little controlled vocabularies that you can uh, attach to an upload pipeline. If you're saying like, okay, everybody in the uh, social media team um, upload here and I can require that you uh, choose at least one of these tags. Um, on upload and you know require or not, and this uh, these kinds of tools that allow um, compliant tagging as you are opening up for crowdsourcing, uh, I think are going to be ever more important. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to talk about tag enrichment. So uh, I think this is essential as well that that uh, your tags, your keyword tags, um, and I don't know, some people don't really like the word tags. They, th they think it sounds non-professional or, um, 
you know, it's like, wait, that's Flickr. Um, a tag is just the metadata value. Um, so get that out of the way. So tags uh, in our system can be person event or general keyword. Um, I think it's important to say what I mean by this. Uh, uh, and then visibility, it's, it's important for, I'll talk in just a second about the uh, diversity issues and the complications around that. Um, uh, visibility settings are essential. Um, I believe that it's super valuable to have definitions. You know, we may know when we assign a keyword exactly what we mean, but you know, there's the homonym problem. There's there's also I don't know what that thing is that you know that keyword you applied. So giving it definitions that become searchable is really important. It's also nice to to have web links on keywords when it's appropriate. Um, and context aware properties. So if your keyword is an event keyword, um, it would be nice if it also had, you know, a date and date and location tags associated with it so that when you apply an event, you know, you could, you could make an event saying like, okay, here's every football game for the fall, here's commencement, here's, you know, all of the scheduled events and we'll uh, uh, pre-populate it with the properties that we know it's going to have. And then when we just apply the one tag, it's, you know, it's like a little metadata template. Now, if you're doing all of that already in, in photo mechanic, good on you. Um, but as I say, this is oftentimes a, a team sport for tagging. Um, so uh, this, is, this is one example. Um, one of our clients is, uh, has a bunch of um, plays. Uh, photographs of, of plays in the system. And that includes, you know, information about the, the playwright and that can include, and we can say, yes, she's a person and we can um, have links on uh, those links straight to her website. So if you don't know who Katori Hall is, you can uh, go find out. Um, event tags can, can have, um, you know, there's, here's some of the uh, properties of this uh, event tag from this presentation today. And it has a, you know, it has a link to the announcement. Um, uh, I don't have location on this one because there is no actual location. The only thing that's there is, uh, uh, since we're virtual, um, but there is a date and there is a, uh, an organization that is attached to this. Um, so the, enrichment of your metadata, I believe, is, is becoming a more essential part of having your collection become um, a, a repository of knowledge about the institution. And in a lot of ways, the visual media collection of a university a institution of higher learning is one of the best places to make um, to, to store this information in a highly accessible manner. Um, it, it's sort of flipping things on the head because in the, in, in the olden days of last year, um, you would expect this to be done in a document management system. And then the photos are like this afterthought. And most of the document management systems do a terrible job with visual media. And my view is that if we've got all of we being, you know, photographers, people working on photo collections, if we have all these capable capabilities associated with the visual media, let's attach this other textual and linked data um, in order to uh, to to make a more valuable repository of information about the institution. OK, um, so I want to talk about. Uh, being conscientious about your tagging, uh, we can we can have a little discussion about this in, in a few minutes. But um, you know, we know that language norms are changing, and uh, I, it's essential to have a block list, um, and you ha you have a need to alter tags. Um, so here's a here's a tag. You know, maybe you use the the keyword girl, and you're like, oh, and that now we better say young woman or you know, I, I didn't want to put an offensive term in here, but you know, there, there are, 
there's a need to change a tag as language norms change in order not to get in trouble. And when you change that tag, you really don't want it to lose, you know, you don't want it to be separated from all the files that have that tag now. So if now there's a more preferred term, let's use the more preferred term by, <clears throat> by editing the name of the tag, which does not in fact edit uh, whether it's attached to the same set of files. Um, this is a, another, another thing that's really, I think an important one for us is that uh, all tags have these three levels of visibility. So you can block it and that means nobody but an administrator will ever see this. And so, um, you know, I have a, a list of offensive words that I have blocked from, uh, from being ever shown as a keyword uh, in the system. We also have this notion of um, searchable versus visible. So a visible tag can be seen by a general user in a tag cloud or in an info overlay. Um, but a searchable tag will power a search but is never seen by, um, by a general user. So that would allow you to have terms that are, you know, maybe slightly on the edge that you know people are going to use, but you really don't want to have them visible. Uh, and it will, it will return results, but it's not, it, it's not visible as to why that is. So that's, um, uh, I, I think that's a, a really, really useful um, characteristic of keywords to be able to, to have these visibility settings. Um, rights tagging, I, I told you that, that I'd hit this a little bit. Um, again, it'd be sort of interesting to hear what, what people are doing now, but you know, for a lot of people, it's just the IPTC rights tag, and maybe there's a contract that is um, in somebody's desk drawer somewhere that tells you you know, what the ownership or the usage rights are for files. And there's a, there's a couple of problems with the IPTC. One is that um, it's oftentimes uh, not describing the actual current state of the usage rights. So it may describe the transfer from the photographer to the institution, if it's a freelancer, let's say, but it's not saying these are the rights we, the institution own. And so that's that's one problem. That's not not always a huge problem, but a lot of times it's wrong. Uh, more importantly, the language that's being used is uh, is oftentimes pretty fuzzy and not easily understandable, and possibly needs a lawyer to interpret. And it's not filterable. Um, you can't really say like, okay, show me everything where the IPTC usage rights say that we have unlimited use. Um, and, and so that's, that's one of the things that we're looking to address. Um, contracts and releases should absolutely be attached to the uh, files themselves when, whenever possible. Um, and when you're crowdsource, when you're collecting files, from you know images from from the you know stakeholders at large then you really should have upload agreements that are part that they have to click just like you know when you go into instagram um, and they give the institution uh, some level of privilege to at least store the file um, and uh, i believe you need to have the ability to filter by right status and so this is a screenshot from from uh, from Tandem Vault, and these um, they're these high level categories: company ownership, unlimited use, limited use, library, no rights, and unknown. Those are all filterable categories, and you can just click on that and find everything that uh, has been tagged as owned by the company. Um, and then each of those uh, sub uh, rights that's in there has this arrangement that's uh, over on the right has up to that amount of information in it you know what is this rights package what is the status um what is uh the uh 
IPTC, what rights will be written into the IPTC usage rights? Is there a second party? And then even is there a clickable contract where I can go find the actual agreement for the uh, purchasing of or the licensing of, of these images? And, and you guys are in a particularly interesting place here because um, the, the visual material that the university collects has a usefulness with no end timeline in sight, you know, beyond the visible time horizon. So the, the pictures of the students today are going to be valuable as an institutional asset through at least the full lives of that student. And if, you know, those few students, you know, I assume relatively few who make a real mark on society, those, those could be useful off into generations. And so the, um, the memorialization of usage rights and good attachment of that information to the images and, and other visual media, I believe is, is an essential part of what a dam system should be doing for a university um, because, because of that usage and because it's, because it's so open-ended. Um, okay, uh, we're getting near the end here <laughs> um, and we'll get to question time. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, most of them are not very smart. Um, so here's the worst part about it is it confuses management teams. Hey, wait a minute, we got artificial intelligence. We don't need to pay anybody to tag those files. Um, and, uh, and that's not true. You, you still need to have somebody who manages your collection. Uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning is not going to take care of that automatically. Um, most of them are built to do one thing at a time, uh, hard to try before you buy. Um, uh, so let's look at what's got high maturity, um, Optical character recognition has been around for ages. That's actually quite, um, quite mature. Uh, speech to text has now gotten really good with, with Siri uh, on the um, iPhone and, uh, and both Google and, and Amazon working really hard on that. Um, identifying uh, naked pictures uh, or violent pictures, that's also really good in, in uh, machine learning. Celebrity recognition, uh, gender and age, depending on the system. Um, so those those things generally work pretty well. And if that's if that's valuable stuff for you, then um, machine learning can be a really really good and valuable thing. Um, medium maturity, general object recognition, and basically just kind of like gives you generic stock photo. You know, that's a squirrel on a bench. Uh, it doesn't give you any context or meaning. Um, trainable systems. Uh, spelled properly, uh, would be, um, uh, are, are also uh, medium maturity. Uh, I, I haven't seen it yet, but Photo Shelter's um, player identification system, uh, I believe, does, it, does a good job. There's a whole lot of ones where you, that are trained on like, what plant is that? Um, so those, those are, are getting there, but they really only kind of do one thing. Um, and they're, they're working with limited set. They do, they're not smart really in any way. And then low and no maturity, uh, sentiment analysis, situational analysis, integrating surrounding data, context and meaning just, just aren't really there yet. Um, and so you're not going to be able to throw a giant collection at a machine learning algorithm and expect it to, um, to, to be able to make sense of a large collection. Um, I have another little bit here, but I think I'm just going to skip it and go straight to questions. Let me just make sure there's nothing. Uh... Oh, yeah, I do want to talk about just very quickly here about multi-departmental dams. Um, so in order to make a multi-departmental dam that actually works, you need to have administers for each different group. Um, and you need to have separation of the content. You should probably have separate landing pages, uh, separate submission pipelines, 
and tags that are not relevant to one group should probably be hidden to, from another. Um, and these are all the kinds of things that just really aren't in most, uh, most dams. Um, and you know, it's one of the things that, that we built from the ground up for. So here's the same library uh, viewed by two different people with uh, two different sets of permissions. Uh, it's really, so on the, on the left is, is the global administrator and on the right is somebody who's just a member of the, the Guarda team and uh, that's all they can see. So departmental, um, uh, departmental functionality, I think, is, is a really important one if you're evaluating a new system. You know, if you're happy with what you got and, and it works fine, then it works fine. But um, okay, that was me blathering on for an entire hour. <laughs> Kenner, Peter, Peter, are you there? Did you go to sleep? Peter, I'm, I'm, I've been wide awake the whole time. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, we do have some questions that people put in the chat and I'm gonna read, I'm gonna start with the more general uh, uh, archiving questions. And then we've got some specific tandem vault questions. And then um, once I'm done with those, we're gonna open it up. And if people wanna just raise their hand to ask a question, I'll call on those folks. And if you wanna ask a question, but you don't want your name out there, uh, you can go ahead and put it in a uh, chat and I will go ahead and read the question without identifying you. But we're gonna start with, uh, with Matt's question about, um, about controlled vocabulary. Um, and Matt says, someone has to be the decider on choosing the right words, cattle versus cow, for example. Are there any absolute right or wrong moves when it comes to choosing the actual vocabulary you use for tagging? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, and the, you know, the first part of the answer is that your controlled vocabulary is an expression of what's important to you and your institution. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, so it's always going to be contextual to your institution. Uh, second of all, one of the most essential parts of successful implementation there is the ability to do some basic blind testing. And uh, so, as an example, uh, a consulting client of mine in the in the natural um, conservation business uh, put their entire um, collection together with a taxonomy that used the Latin names for uh, all of the animals. And it turns out that even all the scientists inside that company all use the common names. And it was done in such a way that it was not fixable. So. An essential part of that then becomes putting the thing in front of uh, regular users and seeing if they understand it. So, uh, you know, some of that, you know, is it a is it a, a a sub or a grinder or a hoagie? You know, that that's um, that's uh, geographically based. So, um, so there's not a, a a good answer other than absolutely you want to test. Um, very frequently, those taxonomies are built in a conference room, a bunch of people sitting around for like a year figuring out like everything they want to know. Um, uh, one of the things that we're excited about with Tandem Vault is that it allows you to create that taxonomy and share it with other people immediately and, and say, hey, could you go find what you're looking for? You know, the, find files for this project. And if they like, I don't see where that is. I don't, oh, you called it that. Okay. Well, then you can know, um, I need to rework it. Okay, thank you. By the way, it's a hoagie, um, just <laughs> so you know. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a sub. <laughs> uh, David from Central Washington University asks, and, and I, I don't know whether you would know the answer to this, honestly, do we need to worry about issues regarding FERPA when storing files and documentation about students within the photo information? And I guess we could put HIPAA in there as well in terms of the federal acts that protect privacy among students and, um, and patients. Yeah, so that's um, you know, one of the things that we have not done is to link people keywords to the person ID of a user um, because I, I think that's a little bit fraught. Um, it, you know, it's an interesting question and certainly one that you would want to consider um, uh, talking to the legal department about. Um, 
you know, a university is collecting all kinds of information about people. Right. You could link it by some unique identifier that, you know, links to the student database system. But there, you know, again, this, this issue about there being special rights around photographs may make that uh, less less valuable, you know, or, le or, you know, not, not really workable in, in a way that, you know, linking to a professor's bio and their books on Amazon um, and, you know, their speeches or stuff like that would be perfectly acceptable. Okay. Okay. Um, there are some specific questions. I've got about a dozen specific questions about Tandem Vault. Um, and then if you want to stop sharing your screen, I can open it up so I can see people raising oh, their sure. hand when we get yeah. done with that. That would be great. Will do. And, uh -oh. and I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I'll be in the vendor lounge tomorrow so I can, can do some of those questions then too. Sure. Um, and so, um, well, let me just go ahead and run, run through these quickly that people put in the in the chat. Um, looking at those curated groups that people, the users created um, that you were looking at, is that something that all the users can see or just that one user or can you fix that? Or, or uh, the, that? Uh, the user who makes the group has control over it. They are the owner of that light box. Okay. And um, so they can invite other people to it and share it. Gotcha. Okay. Or and not. Do Tandem, Vault, do, do Tandem Vault and Lightroom work together? And, and if so, how? Um, so we, uh, Tandem Vault 2 has a Lightroom publish plugin, but we haven't updated it for three yet. Um, we will. Uh, we do accept a, an exported Lightroom keyword um, document and we'll imp can import that and that can populate your uh, taxonomy tree. Okay, so if I've created, um, this is me now, if I've created a hierarchy in Photo Mechanic or Lightroom, I can export that and now everybody else has to use that as well if, there, if we have crowdsource tagging going on. Yes, yeah, so when you, you the, the um, uh, permission of an administrator, the, the, you know, there's levels of permission. So a general user can browse the taxonomy tree, a tagger or better, well, a tagger can assign files to tags, and then you have to be up in the upper levels of management in order to manipulate the tree. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, and that, that answers the question about permission settings around, among administrators. Um, when you were showing the football tagging and finding the missing images that didn't have the, the finding images that did not have a football tag, was that some sort of AI based thing where it went and found football photos or did you just look in the folder of football photos and find the one that didn't have tags? Um, I, it was a, it was a manual process. Um, we, we're, uh, we're rolling out um, AI tagging for transcripts. Uh, in videos tomorrow. Um, and that's just a, a tiny step away from, you know, general keyword tagging. But most of my experiments have shown that generically to be not particularly useful. Okay. Um, you know, most of the football game photo, football photos are going to be like shot at a game. It's going to be fairly easy to tag them all as football. Right. Understood. Um, Brenda was asking about damn programs that let you tag in the cloud. Tandem Vault obviously does that. Are, are there others that you know of offhand? Um, you know, I've I've done this as a with my other hat as you know Peter Krogh, Dan Dam consultant. Um, I've been looking for other applications that do this, and I have been really surprised at. Uh, I, I haven't found a single other application that that does um, drag and drop tagging, for instance. Okay. Okay. And so, you, yeah. so you essentially are typing, and and that and usually they don't have you know unlimited multi level taxonomy. Okay. Um, if I'm using Photo Mechanic or Lightroom, and I'm using all the IPTC information, um, that all flows seamlessly into tandem vault uh, that's yeah we we read it all that. yeah okay mm -hmm. um which is which is similar i think most 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 of them do that um yeah so although there's the, I, I will put an asterisk there um 
it, it's surprising to me how many applications sort of have arrested development <laughs> at some earlier stage. Uh, I was using uh, Widen um, to name one name and they basically supported the IIM model, which is the, mo the model that became obsolete in like 2004. And there's a lot of applications that won't support the IPTC extended. Um, and, and you really just have to test. Okay. Um, I, I had asked you this question and, and there's a good question here from Sam. Um, I'd asked this question a while back about um, uh, if I tag things in the system, do they then show up if I download the photo in the, um, yeah. in the metadata? But yes. Sam's question is, if you can block or hide tags, does that mean that the metadata isn't IPTC? That is, if, there's a, if, there's a, if I download a photo and there's a hidden tag, where is it? Um, so when a file is uploaded, um, the, we, don't, we don't strip any tags out of the original file but we have a, essentially a database of tags that say, you know, F word is blocked. And um, if you were to download a derivative that our system creates, F word will not be in there. But if you were to download the original file, if you have permission to download the original file, the original metadata plus metadata created in our system would be there. Okay, that makes sense. Um... Okay, so David from Endicott College says, is there a way in Tandem Vault to search for an individual or set of photos via some sort of artificial intelligence and batch remove or hide them in, in the case of a student or an employee that you no longer want their photos to be seen? Um, so uh, no, no face tagging that's going to be able to find all instances of a person. Um, okay. You know, it's a, that's, that's an, I'd be very interested if anybody's got face tagging that they're using on anything other than a small level of, you know, small group of, of high profile, you know, faculty or staff. Um, you have to train it. And if you're talking about, you know, a university with, with hundreds or thousands of staff <clears throat> and tens of thousands of students, that, that's, uh, not an insignificant job. Um, as far as uh, blocking stuff, then, you know, yes, you can find everything with a tag and you can easily remove it from any public facing collection. So only the highest level administrators would have access to it. Uh, or you could delete it from the system if you, you know, if you really hated that person. <laughs> Um, I don't think anybody in this group has anyone like that, that they would want to remove from their, from their damn system. Um, Glenn had a couple of questions. Uh, what about making a, a keyword, a, specifically a keyword tag out of each word in the description field? Um, so description is searched and so th that's, that's more likely to junk up your keywords. Right. And, and again, this, you know, this gets to the, the place where uh, there has to be some level of discretion and hierarchy of importance that the collection manager is bringing to the party. And, and so, you know, if you put too much in there, it's, it's just spam. Um, uh, one of the things that, that we're putting in our video though, that is, is kind of an interesting um sideways answer to that is proximity search. So if you want to say, I want to find instances of two words that are within, you know, X number of words of each other, um, which is, is valuable. And that same thing, uh, we haven't applied it to description, but all the plumbing is there to do it. Oh. That, that could be quite useful. Well, I can see that being very useful because it's often the case where you search and the two words are you get a photo that has nothing to do with the two words together, but if they're within a couple of words of each other, that would make it a much easier way to find an important photo than if, you know, one's a keyword tag and one's in the description and they don't really, they're not, that, that makes sense. That's good. 
Yeah, I would also, uh, I'm, I'm excited about the kind of stuff that we can do in the out years, like for instance, search the links that are applied to a file mm -hmm. for any words that are in the linked page and factor that in as some level of search. Wow. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, we can already do now with place names with, uh, with Google Maps. So if you've got GPS coordinates in a file, you can search Google Maps and find uh, results that are, that are, you know, in proximity to the file. Yeah. Right. So th that, that I think this, this linked data thing is, is a lot more promising for meaning and context than what machine learning or artificial intelligence is going to be able to do. Okay, we we can open things up now to folks. If you want to just raise your hand, um, I will I will call on you. You can unmute yourself and ask a question. You can be either specific about tandem vault or or more general about um, about. Okay, and Kristen Kristen Grace has a has a question. Hi, Peter. Uh, thank hey. you so much. Um, this was really really helpful. Um, I have a question about tandem vault and on the website. Um, it says that it's, um, it's app convenience. What does that mean? Um, so where we navigate like an app, like just, a, you know, a computer application and. Okay. So uh, do, you, do you have, you mentioned Lightroom kind of yeah. a uh, integration. Are there other app integrations, Adobe apps that are integrated? So at the, at the moment in Tandem Vault 3, uh, we haven't rolled it out. Uh, it's uh, Tandem Vault Two has a bunch of those app those integrations, and um, uh, those are probably the next thing on the list uh, once um, the machine learning transcription service uh, delivers tomorrow. Um, but the that'll probably be Dropbox and Box and Google Drive for in out, and then um, uh, I'm chomping at the bit to get Lightroom integration. I, I really, really want that, um, like now, but, um, uh, and simultaneously in, in design, do you have plans for like InDesign integration? Yeah. And that's a thing we're looking at. We, we had the connector, um, the Silicon publishing connector. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had that implemented in tandem vault too. Um, my understanding is that Adobe's actually opened up some other pathways into integration. And that's a thing to um, Watch for us to check on. The, the other thing is, is that our architecture is such that we can actually turn the web-based um, interface into a locally running application that just runs on your computer. And if, you, if you're familiar with Slack, um, Slack is just actually a web page that's running as an application on your computer if you have Slack on your computer. Okay. Um, and that's the same architecture we're using. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. More questions, folks? This is your chance. This guy knows everything about digital asset management. Everybody's ready for lunch, I guess. <laughs> it's possible. Um, well, I'm I'm around tomorrow during the the vendor thing, and we're um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And I don't know if my address is my contact information is uh, is something that you guys have shared, uh, Ken. But of yeah. course, anybody can feel free to ping me, reach out, and ping me at any point. Um, we put it in the chat, I think, and then we'll 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 make sure it's available when we post. Um, we're going to post the videos of these uh, of these sessions um, next week, and I'll I'll put the link in there as well when we when, when we do that. Um, and I, I would recommend, folks, if you're if you're if you're looking at dam systems or whatever, I, I did the walkthrough with Peter with Tandem Vault a uh, month or so ago, and uh, it's very well thought out. It, it it answers a lot of the sort of questions that I was asking um, over the years. Uh, you know, we 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 run Photo Shelter for brands here. Um, and that's pretty well ingrained in our in our system right now. But if I if I were looking right now, I'd look real hard at that. So, um, oh, thanks. So, so Amanda, you you have a few things to give away. I'm going to um, 
let's see, where am I going here? I'm going to go, yeah. Amanda's going to give away some books. So let me get my screen up here and show you what that looks like. Um, Amanda, you want to give away some books? Sure, yeah. Um, Peter is very generous and he's um, giving away many of his books. So I've got 10 to give away today. Um, I went through and did some random number generating to choose the winners here. And I'm gonna put them in the chat and I'll also read them out loud right now. Um, and then I will reach out to you via email to get your, your address to send it to you. So um, our winners are Amy Obadzinski, Brittany Greider, Jeff Miller, Kristen Grace, Kurt Stepnitz, Lou Bruns, Mark Philbrick, Misty McElroy, Mark Diorio, and Nate Edwards. Congratulations, Congratulations all. And, and uh, as I said, um, uh, you can choose which book you'd like. Um, and I'm happy to give you a rundown if you're not sure which one is the right one. Perfect. All right. Thank Glenn, you. you to, Glenn, you want to say a few words? Not really, but sure. Um, well, thank you, Peter, uh, especially for stepping in also for uh, pointing us in the right direction uh, regarding uh, digital asset management. Uh, I know it's something we all love and also hate at the same time. So doing it better is always uh, very important. Um, everyone be back at two o'clock uh, for our next set of uh, discussions and presentations and have fun uh, at lunch. So yep. we have an hour and a half. Come on back. Come on back in 90 minutes, folks. And we'll have uh, we'll have some we'll have some good stuff this afternoon. Uh, we're going to have Robin Layton from Nikon, uh, Nikon shooter. And then we're going to do the Nikon shootout. Uh, and that'll open up this afternoon. And we'll have a, an on location, at, you know, at home or on camp. I don't know what the prompt is going to be, but we'll find that out uh, after her after her presentation. So we'll see you all there. Everybody enjoy their submarine sandwiches. <laughs> I'm going to find a hoagie right now, Peter. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't get them in North Carolina. I got to go home to Philly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for having me, guys. I'll uh, look forward to, to seeing everybody tomorrow.